Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to our event after Miracle, Germany's international role in a world of uncertainty. My name is Mika Altola, director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. It is my great honor to open up uh, this event, uh, a conversation with uh, first class experts on the issue and, and topic. Uh, I was going to open up the event by looking a little bit closer to the cultural resources for political leadership in Western democracies. And um, in these types of studies, there's usually two types of, of leaders. Uh, a continuum from, from uh, on the one hand, of custodians of, of uh, principal figures. They have their lofty visions for the for the nation and and they proclaim to have a vision of something higher. They take a moral high ground and translate that into practical issues. So there's always a normative moral charts in practical manner uh, matters. On the other hand, you have a principle uh, that might be called arbiters, kind of a negotiators of, of, uh, of uh, or problem solvers. So they do the other way around. So instead of focusing on, on normative and moral issues, they uh, try to manage uh, things in a, in a pragmatic way. It is seldom that, that a figure becomes a custodian of pragmatic approach. And in Angela Merkel, I think we have that kind of a figure. It usually takes, a, takes years or decades of becoming that type of custodian of the pragmatic approach. And uh, I think now when we are talking about the post-Merkel uh, German and, and European approaches to foreign policy in uncertain world, there's a big question mark. Is there going to be any custodian of the pragmatic approach, kind of a negotiator, a problem solver, who can slice the big issues into manageable holes and, and, and even solve those? But uh, this is my opening remarks for this conversation, and I'll, I will now yield the floor to our brilliant uh, research fellow, uh, Thomas Isomarko, who will lead the discussion further and deeper. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mika, for your opening words. And uh, welcome to this event on uh, Germany's international role after uh, the September 26th uh, elections. Um, many in attendance have probably followed uh, the political developments in Germany rather closely. Uh, of course, uh, the big thing about these elections is that Angela Merkel is leaving her post. Uh, that's, um, that alone makes these uh, elections historic, because it is the first time in German post-war history that uh, the chancellor will not run for re-election. Um, Merkel's withdrawal alone would actually make this use quite unpredictable. But the elections also take uh, come against the backdrop of broader changes in German politics. Uh, the ties between German voters and uh, the German parties have weakened for quite some time already. And this has led to increased volatility and fragmentation in the German party political landscape during recent years. And we have seen the leading party in the polls now change several times, <laughs> even within a period of six months or so. Uh, but I will uh, let our uh, excellent experts tell you everything about what has happened in recent months and what will await us uh, in the years to come. 
we have three speakers. Um, first, our guest speakers, uh, Dr. Jana Puglieren, who is the head of the ECFR's Berlin office and also a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she also directs the ECFR's Reshape Global Europe project. Uh, which seeks to develop new strategies for Europeans to understand and engage with uh, the dramatic changes that we see uh, in the international order. Uh, before joining the ECFR in uh, January 2020, she also uh, headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And prior to this, she was an advisor on disarmament, arms control, and non-proliferation issues in the German Bundestag. And our second uh, guest expert is Dr. Ulrike Franke, uh, senior policy fellow at the ECFR. And she leads the ECFR's technology and European power initiative. And her research topics include German, uh, and European security and defense issues, the future of warfare, and uh, the impact of new technologies on geopolitics and warfare. And uh, to give us comments uh, after the first two presentations is our very own, uh, who is a leading researcher here at FIA, focuses on the EU's foreign security policy, also German foreign security policy, the transatlantic relationship. Uh, Niklas returned to FIA in 2009 uh, after spending uh, some time uh, abroad at the Rand Corporation, at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies, and at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin. But now, uh, <laughs> I'll give the floor to Jana and Ulrike, and let's hope our microphone yeah. will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas uh, and Mika and Fia in particular for hosting us today. It's an enormous pleasure to be here in person mm -hmm. in Helsinki um, and yeah, to be able to do this together with you. Um, we haven't had these opportunities for such a long time, so it's just... Um, a real big pleasure and a real big thank you. And also to the audience for, for listening in and for taking an interest in uh, German elections, German foreign and security policy. Um, I think it's the most interesting election that we have seen in yeah, a decade that I can actually think of. And what we do here now today is, I think, first and foremost, uh, glass ball reading and speculation because um, looking at the polls, it's too early to tell um, and too close to call. Um, maybe um, I'll start with a little overview where we are and uh, pointing out the highlights are the most significant um, developments. Is that the death of German social democracy is uh, greatly exaggerated. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say it's a uh, long live German social democracy. Um, we have so just a, a little background, the SPD is now leading um, the polls with 25%, um, which is a, a complete turnaround because the Social Democrats have been in decline uh, steadily for a long time. And now we see uh, an historical comeback. Um, Olaf Scholz, the SPD's uh, candidate for chancellor, is clearly uh, the most popular candidate um, maybe because the other candidates have made uh, mistakes or are, are seen as weak candidates, um, but uh, he is clearly leading um, the polls. Interestingly, the SPD campaign strategy um, this time is very interesting because they basically portray Olaf Scholz as Merkel in a suit and from another party, obviously. Um, so Olaf Scholz uh, symbolizes everything Mika talked about in the beginning, kind of the stable anchor uh, in Germany, continuity, reliability. Um, and, and he's actually campaigning uh, also on that ticket. He's trying to, <laughs> to copy Merkel, also kind of copying her famous um, hand gesture. <laughs> um, so interestingly, um, 
the party as such has moved very much to the left in recent years. Um, so Olaf Scholz was actually a, a bit of a surprise as a candidate because he um, is a very conservative force within the party, whereas the party as such has moved to the left with the election of its party leaders um, and with uh, taking positions, especially, I think we come to that later, on security and defense that are really uh, center-left positions. Um, so this is the first um, interesting thing to watch, uh, the, the kind of rebirth of social democracy in Germany. Um, the second interesting phenomena uh, looking at this campaign is the rise and fall uh, of the Green Party. So for actually many months, think tankers like us, when we were asked what's the most likely outcome of this election, we would always say uh, it's a black-green coalition. Um, that was the most likely scenario, uh, the conservatives in the lead, but then the Greens as a real strong second for force in the coalition. Um, and actually the Greens, Annalena Baerbock, um, they both were identified as the biggest opponent by the CDU CSU. So in the beginning, the race seemed to be like a duel uh, rather than a trio uh, between Armin Laschet and Annalena Baerbock, and that had changed completely. Um, so the Greens had uh, a search in uh, the polls early on when they announced their candidate for chancellor. They were uh, praised by German media um, and they, they really um, were on the go. They, they, <laughs> they had a good run. But then um, some uh, issues emerged with the CV of Annalena Baerbock, which was not uh, kind of rock solid <laughs> and had uh, some mistakes in it. And Annalena Baerbock also published a book um, and she was accused of plagiarism afterwards. So there were many mistakes done that um, observers thought were amateurish and where kind of the rationale emerged um, that the Greens weren't fit for, for office, not fit for the task. Um, interestingly, the Greens in this campaign are the only party which really openly advocate a change of the status quo. Um, they emphasize that all the time um, that, uh, that the status quo is not sustainable and also in foreign policy, but also in domestic policy. And this cannot be another status quo election, um, but um, that change is needed. Although um, they are currently only at 15 to 16 percent um, in the polls, um, they are very likely to be part of the next government. Um, there is basically no scenario or hardly any scenario are feasible without the Greens um, being um, a junior partner in, in the next coalition government. And third uh, and last trend, we see the historical low of the German conservatives of the CDU and its sister party CSU. Um, and if you compare this with the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, mm -hmm. basically one and a half years ago, kind of shortly after the crisis started, the CDU had a huge comeback. They were leading the polls by 40%, uh, fantastic approval ratings, for the CDU, CSU, the chancellor still is the most popular politician, but the party's approval ratings have dropped to 20%. This is an all-time low. Um, and the candidate for chancellor um, of the uh, CDU, Amin Laschet, is uh, considered the most unpopular candidate the, the party ever had. Um, that is also due to leadership struggles within the party. Um, basically, what we are watching is um, an infight in the party between the more centrist uh, Merkelian um, camp and the conservative uh, camp who have, um, has accused Merkel and the Merkelian camp forever for moving the party too much towards um, the center. So Armin Laschet did not um, succeed in establishing uh, himself as a credible heir. Um, and the most credible heir of the Germans nowadays seem to be um, Olaf Scholz. Just briefly in terms of coalitions, so um, we will see for the first time most likely three party families involved. This is a first um, for German um, policy. We, see, we will see most likely a chancellor with a very low majority. Um, and the big question will be how stable this government will operate, um, how quick it will be able to take decisions, and if we won't see a lot of stalemate because mutual forces are basically neutralizing themselves. For example, just one example on EU fiscal policy, the SPD and the Greens advocate for deeper integration of the Eurozone, open for a fiscal union, whereas the Liberals are completely opposed. If the Liberals then get the finance ministry, we will see two trends that basically uh, yeah, are contrary to each other, and um, we'll see how that plays out. 
The two likely scenarios, most likely scenarios today, as I said, too close to call, too early to tell, is a Jamaica coalition with the SPD, um, with the CDU in the lead. So Ami Laschet as chancellor, Jamaica would mean uh, CDU, CSU, the Greens and the FDP, or the so-called traffic light coalition with a chancellor, um, Olaf Scholz, the SPD in the lead, and again, the Greens um, and the FDP. And there are other uh, possibilities. Um, the most uh, controversial uh, option would be a red, red, green government, uh, which would include the very left, a radical left party in Germany, um, which um, observers uh, mostly say will be unlikely because of their foreign policy positions, but it's still um, kind of, it's in the numbers, it's possible. Um, however, um, I assume that the FDP in particular, but also the Greens will be kingmakers and will have a very strong hand, especially if they are the ones who decide whether we will see a Chancellor Scholz or Laschet. They have a lot uh, kind of uh, bargaining chips in their hands then. And I'll leave the rest to Ulrike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jana, and a wonderful good morning also from me. And thanks so much for, for having us here. It is indeed a, a true pleasure uh, to be here in person. Um, so Jana already gave a brilliant overview of the situation. As you can see, it is complicated. Um, like her, I had the pleasure, or I have the pleasure, of following the twists and turns of this election campaign. And I think she has shown quite nicely that there are a lot of things we don't know. Who will win, first of all? Which coalition it will be? Who will be chancellor? But at the same time, there are, in fact, also a lot of things that we do know. And the reason for that is that these parties that run um, for, for government or for election, of course, publish election programs. And so that's what I want to focus on, and specifically um, the, the security, uh, so the foreign and, and defense policy elements in these election programs. So we have the four parties, or six parties really, because the CDU, CSU is actually two parties um, combined, but let's take them as one. And these um, five, five parties have published five programs um, these five programs together are almost a thousand pages long, so you know it's a really thick book. Um, and I, I'm not going to try to kind of give you an overview of that, but there are sections on on foreign and defense policy, and these taken together are some ninety pages long, so a bit more digestible. And I've 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 read though those, and I thought that rather than going through them, you know, every party, every point. I picked certain issues and points that are crucial uh, for Germany, for Germany's foreign policy, um, and and kind of you know Germany in Europe and Germany's impact uh, in in international relations and uh, as as one of the important players in the European Union. Maybe just very briefly before uh, I do that, I think it's important to note first that even though in this election campaign we had quite an important focus on the candidates. I mean, Jana pointed out that, you know, some of the candidates aren't even that representative of the parties. Um, the candidates here, when it comes to foreign and security policy, I would argue, aren't actually that different in the sense that they, the candidates don't necessarily have such different positions. And this has to do with the fact that overall there is a relatively, you know, very broadly speaking, a broad agreement in Germany about foreign policy issues in general, I go into detail in a second, but also that the candidates are all a bit middle of the row candidates when it comes to their uh, their parties. And I would say, um, especially Scholz is, is maybe not as representative of the party as, as some things. So um, I think in terms of the candidates, it, it, it matters much less, but of course the coalitions are formed by the parties and the parties do say different things about different issues. So let me let let me dive in, and I wanted to start with um, the relationship of Germany and Europe to the United States, so the transatlantic relations. Um, I think the first thing to note when you read the party programs is that transatlantic relations aren't in danger. Um, I would say that there is an agreement by all the major parties, and by this I mean everyone but the Linke Party, which is the extreme left, and the AfD, which is the extreme right. Um, that are kind of the outsiders here. Um, there's an agreement by all the major parties that the US is the most important world political partner, that's from the CDU program, um, and that the transatlantic partnership remains a central pillar of German foreign policy, that's from the Greens. 
However, there is, of course, unsurprisingly, a growing realization that, you know, the transatlantic partnership needs to be renewed. The SPD speaks of a new beginning that is needed. On that, I, however, have to say that, you know, there are not the most concrete proposals here. Um, there is there is a uh, there is a focus on democratic values and we need to work together with the US on democratic values and the like. Uh, but I think the, the most concrete reaction that pretty much all the, the major parties have when it comes to the transatlantic relationship is to say that we want a strong transatlantic relationship, but we want to strengthen the European side as well, the European pillar, um, uh, the, the European Union. And so let me make a few points on, on Europe and the EU. Again, all the, the parties but the Linke and the AfD are very clearly pro-European and pro-EU. They want Europe to be a stronger actor and they want Europe to be a stronger actor in foreign policy. And I think it's really not noteworthy that all four parties, so the Conservatives, um, the, the Social Democrats, the Liberals and the Greens, all four parties are in favor of majority voting on foreign policy in the European Union. So that's very clearly in their, in their program. Uh, the CDU, SVD and FDP also want the EU to get a permanent seat in the, EU, in the UN Security Council. Not that that's particularly likely to happen, <laughs> I'd say, but it's in the, in the program. And I think this is rather very German. Um, the European army makes an appearance in a lot of those programs. <laughs> so the SPD and the FDP, so the Social Democrats and the Liberals, actually specifically speak of a European army that needs to be formed. The CDU speaks of joint European armed forces in the long term. And the Greens also want to expand, enhance cooperation among armed forces in the EU and pool military capabilities. So, you know, sounds as if there is a lot of agreement, but of course the devil is in the details. Um, because just as an example, in the program of the Greens, a bit hidden away in the very last sentence of the section on, on uh, European security and defense, there is a sentence that basically says and states that the Greens are against the European Defence Fund in its current form. So the European Union has created the European Defence Fund, the first time that the European Union is actually investing in, in military capabilities. And the Greens believe that, that this is basically civilian European money that is being repurposed for military um, purposes. And, and they say that the EU shouldn't be allowed to do this, um, that I think is, is quite uh, important. Um, and there's also, I would say, a quite different understanding between the parties on how the EU as a whole should function in the future, like what the approach should be. So the FDP, the Liberals, they are really going United States of Europe in the long run. They, you know, they say we want a federal state and after that a European army. So, so quite, um, uh, yeah, quite United States of Europe. Uh, and the Greens are... I, I almost want to say surprisingly, because I was a bit surprised when I read the program, very pro-EU enlargement. So they mention, of course, the Western Balkans, most parties do. They mention Turkey as still a likely candidate. And um, in the long run, they, they would like to leave the door open to the EU-associated members of the Eastern Partnership. And these countries are Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova. So, you know, that's, I feel, quite a statement to say that, that these countries should join the the European Union. Um, I will end in a second with uh, the parties, uh, how the parties see the contribution of, of Germany um, to its own and, and Europe's security and defense, but let me maybe very briefly give you also an overview of, of the kind of planned relations with other players, and I'm sure that Jana may have to add something on that, but um, I, I started with the US, right, but of course there's also Russia and China, so let's have a quick look at what the parties say on this. Uh, on China. I mean, I would say that in Germany and also in the election programs, there is a recognition, an overall recognition, that we have entered an, an era of systemic rivalry. I mean, systemic rivalry between US and China at first, but also, if you like, the, the, the West uh, with, with China. So rhetorically, all four parties position themselves as, as yeah, it's quite critical to China. Um, I thought it was actually really interesting that most um, of the, the four major parties even use the exact same line about uh, China being a competitor, a partner, and a systemic rival, which is this formulation that you may recognize from like NATO and the US also uses a similar uh, um, formulation. So this is all, all in there. 
that being said, you know, glass ball, I would say that a CDU led government or the CDU is, is a bit more likely to continue to some extent the kind of current middle course when it comes to China. There, there is a kind of rethinking, but, but still, while others, and especially the Greens and the FDP, are much more focused on human rights issues and are much more likely to call out China and also Russia on human rights violations. So in the FDP program, they mention Hong Kong, they mention Taiwan in quite some detail. Um, the Greens call Taiwan a country in the, in the um, election program, which I thought was an interesting kind of little signal. Um, but I think there, there, there is a bit of a position fight uh, when it comes to China with regard to the parties, but also in all of Germany. And there are different players involved. You know, the, the industry has spoken up. There's, there's definitely, you know, there's something in the air that says we need to rethink our relationship with, with uh, uh, China. But quite honestly, I'm not entirely sure where, where this is going to go and how important this is going to be. Um, on Russia briefly, uh, just to reiterate on Russia in particular, but also on other things, the Linke and the AfD are enormous outliers. So the Linke wants to leave NATO and they want to create a security community with Russia and the AfD um, as well. So here, this is really quite outside the German consensus. The other parties, not so much. Um, all the other parties say they want to keep the Russian sanctions or even um, uh, strengthen them if necessary. Nord Stream 2 uh, is, isn't mentioned by everyone. Um, so the Greens want to stop it. Uh, the, the FDP wants a, wants a moratorium. The AfD wants to uh, say that the completion is essential, but all the others don't mention it. And I think all the others are rather happy that Nord Stream 2, in a way, has been pushed um, aside with the deal between uh, the US and, and Germany uh, recently. Uh, but on Russia, again, I think this, this kind of harder, maybe more muscular, I don't know, uh, human rights focus that we see particularly among the Greens and the FDP could play a role. But since, you know, these, these parties are not going to lead the government um, and will be in coalitions, the coalitions is likely to, to weaken uh, this approach. And then final, um, I would say most important point that I work on, on defense and security in particular, but it's also maybe the area where there are kind of really important differences, at least between the CDU and, and the Greens, in, is about actual military capabilities of Germany and, and Germany in NATO. Uh, Interesting conceptual difference that I, that I picked up on. The CDU actually says military power is an element of foreign policy. A statement that maybe outside of Germany, you know, people would just react with, as a, with, a, with a shrug of the shoulders. In Germany, I thought that, that that was quite a statement because it's not necessarily what everyone says. And contrary to that, um, the Greens appear still somewhat skeptical when it comes to the military, military power. And in fact, the Greens in their program as only party say they want to adopt a feminist foreign and security policy. And while there are different ways of you know, defining feminist foreign policy, feminist foreign policy also tends to be pretty skeptical when it comes to military tools and funding the military and all of this. So um, I think there are conceptual differences that are worth noting, but there are also practical differences. So again, to just take random examples, the CDU wants to actually increase the number of Bundeswehr soldiers from currently 185,000 approximately to 203,000. That's also the current German policy, but still it's the only party that says we want to do this. The CDU is explicitly supporting NATO's 2% goal, so the idea of investing 2% of GDP into defense. The FDP explicitly supports this, but um, the others, not so much. So the, the, the SPD is not explicit. They say, you know, we should fund, fund the, the, the Bundeswehr as needed. And the Greens reject the NATO 2% goal as a way of calculating uh, Germany's contribution to NATO. And this is an interesting thing because they basically say the 2% is calculated in a way that doesn't make sense, which fair enough, a lot of people agree with. But they don't say, we want to fund the Bundeswehr to that level, we just want to calculate it differently. So there's a bit of a, um ambiguity um, here. And I'll end this whole discussion of security and defense policy and, and, and my comments with, um, with a bang, uh, bad pun intended, um, <laughs> because there is one issue that's actually really important and yet not really discussed enough, and that's the issue of nuclear sharing. 
Um, NATO nuclear sharing. So Germany is, is, is a member of NATO's nuclear sharing uh, program, political member, but also a military member insofar as Germany has stationed US nuclear weapons on its uh, soil. Has for a long time, but in this, in the next four years, this will actually become an important topic, if not the important topic of foreign policy, because it is in this term that Germany needs to decide basically whether or not to continue this, this nuclear sharing, because they need to decide what kind of airplanes to get to replace the, 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 the increasingly old ones that are currently carrying, can carry um, US nuclear weapons. And this, this issue has been postponed so many times that now it's really the time that the next coalition government will need to decide this. And it's very unclear where we're going with this. Actually, the CDU is the only party that clearly says we support nuclear sharing and we want to continue it. The Linke, of course, is against. But the strong position on nuclear sharing. So they all say that we want to abolish nuclear weapons. Fair enough. I think everyone has that. Um, but 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 they don't necessarily say you know what they're going to do on on the specific um, issue. So I think this is where coalitions may really matter. If the CDU is in government, Germany is I would say likely to continue the nuclear sharing program. If the CDU isn't in government and it's anyone else, especially if it is this really left leaning, red green red or green red red um, coalition. Germany may actually leave nuclear sharing, I want to say, almost by accident. And that seems to be a pretty, pretty big deal um, to me. So, yeah, um, final word on the, on the coalitions. There are many options. Um, I think the most, the most different in terms of all these foreign policy and especially the defense policy points that I mentioned just now um, would be either, you know, either you have a CDU-led government or you have something green, red, red, uh, uh, red, green, red, the, the most left wing wing options, although I think this is still pretty unlikely. But um, yeah, I think a, a government that doesn't include the, the CDU, so that it's most likely SPD led, may actually change the, the foreign policy approach of, of Germany to, to, to several issues to some extent. I mean, you know, we don't do like extreme going from one point to the other in, in Germany, but there, there there is some change in the air on some issues that I think are not wording, uh, noteworthy. And so I'll stop here, I've already taken too long, but maybe Jan has to add something on that. Thomas, when I, uh, can I just add of course, before of course, we please. go into the discussion please. and <laughs> I think before we make it a bit more lively. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so maybe a footnote on the on the nuclear sharing arrangement that goes back to what I said about the shift to the left within the SPD. So the two party leaders, um, Saskia Esken and Walter Borjans, have openly advocated for leaving the nuclear sharing arrangement. They have supported a push by uh, Rolf Mützenich, very influential in the SPD. Um, on that matter, uh, last year we had a huge debate about this. So there, so the SPD is not let's say, wholeheartedly sold on the yeah. <laughs> nuclear sharing arrangement within NATO. Um, I wanted to add just a few data points because uh, ECFR does a lot of uh, data polling. And um, so we uh, every two years, we do a survey amongst policymakers. Um, and just to, to give you an overview, like in, the, in these polls, I mean, and that isn't, I think, a big surprise, but it really gets obvious that Germany is the center of gravity um, when it comes to uh, yeah, coalitions in the EU. And from that, I think it's safe to say that Angela Merkel will be greatly missed um, and that she has been a very unifying factor in the European Union, keeping member states on board, despite also uh, doing the opposite, I think, <laughs> during the Eurozone crisis or during the migration crisis, but overall, um, I think Germany under Merkel has been a very stabilizing force and Mer Merkel herself had a very big influence. And I think it's by no means clear that her successor will have basically this, the same gravity uh, and the same influence in the EU. I think when it comes to working with Macron, uh, Macron would happily work with Olaf Scholz. They know each other well, but also I mean, Laschet um, has tried to strengthen ties with France and is very Francophile as is Annalena Baerbock. So I think uh, for France, there are no surprise in here, um, surprises. Um, France, uh, I think, um, can work with all three candidates uh, very well on the Franco-German engine. Heavily depends also on the, German, uh, on the French election next year. 
Um, so next uh, week we will publish some uh, data polls. We have asked other Europeans, and this time not policymakers, but the public, what they think um, of Merkel and basically uh, Germany's future as a European leader. And um, I want to share just one uh, point because it's I don't want to spoil our big launch event uh, next week, but um, there is an interesting uh, phenomena in there. Um, so the public, um, we asked one question about... Um, in which areas do people trust Germany to lead in the EU and defend the European interest? And actually, the biggest uh, support that we saw uh, was in the area of economic and finance policy, which is <laughs> quite astonishing um, when we look at uh, Germany's austerity uh, policy uh, during the Eurozone crisis and our obsession with public debt. Um, but Europeans seem to trust Germany and that area and also when it comes to the defense of democracy and human rights. So here expectations or especially trust is uh, quite high among Europeans. Where it's comparatively low though, and that I think is a perfect starting point also for, for you, Niklas, is mm -hmm. when it comes to dealing with the big powers, mm -hmm. especially China, but also Russia. Um, so China is basically the area where other Europeans, like people out there, trust Germany least uh, to lead in the European interest, the EU. Um, so I think that's just, um, I mean, it's not astonishing. Our China policy has not particularly been Europeanized lately. Um, but I think in a, if we come back to the title of the panel and the era of great power competition and all this, I think Germany would need to step up to the plate a bit more when it comes to dealing with the big powers and be more a, a more credible and reliable leader in the European Union. And that's it from my side. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, these uh, excellent opening remarks. Niklas, the floor is yours. Please uh, go ahead and uh, give your comments on, on these. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you so much, uh, Jana and Ulrike, for, for these opening remarks. That was a, such a comprehensive overview of what's going on in German politics, what are the party programs about. And I think that is very important because, and I come to that in a minute, I think from the Nordic perspective, from a, from a German sitting here in Finland, I think these elections are quite quite interesting and quite important because there are a lot of elements uh, that I think, you know, um, policymakers or the public here in, in, in Finland and in the Nordic countries more general should watch quite closely. So I think that was uh, a very interesting and very, very uh, engaging overview. Um, what I find interesting is especially um, this fragmentation of the party landscape in Germany that we are seeing right now. And it is something that has been going on in Finland already for, for quite a while. When you look, uh, when you go into parliament elections in, in, in Finland and you, you uh, switch on uh, the election program in the evening, you actually don't know which uh, party will head out on top. You know, they all are most of the time polling around 20%, 18%, and there are uh, multi-party coalitions. So what we see now in Germany is this kind of Finlandization <laughs> of, of, uh, um, of, of the party landscape. And I think um, that, will be, um, that will be interesting uh, to see um, uh, what that means in terms of German politics. And you already mentioned that it um, might affect Germany's ability to... Um, to to be to be influential on, on on some of the agenda points that are discussed in the European Union because there are these party differences maybe between the liberals and the social democrats or the liberals and the greens um, so so how this new modus operandi is going to take off with three parties in a coalition that that will be interesting to watch um, and um, I think it's interesting to watch from a Finnish perspective because Germany and German leadership in the European Union is, is very important from, from, from the Nordic perspective. And that, that has two reasons. Uh, we published, uh, together with Thomas and some others, uh, a special issue of German politics uh, last uh, spring, where we analyzed German leadership in, in the common foreign and security policy. And what we found out in most of the things that we looked at is that German leadership is the strongest when it takes um, 
um, smaller countries into account, the position of smaller countries, or also the countries on the margins, if it's Central and Eastern European countries, and uh, or if it's small countries like, like Finland. Um, that is not always the case when we think about, for example, uh, Nord Stream 2. We know that there are quite a lot of differences. But when Germany gives this kind of voice opportunity, it's, it's, it's the strongest. And that is something uh, that, that Finland uh, always appreciated, that, that, it, um, that, that Germany pays so much attention to EU institutions and also pays attention to the interests of smaller member states, that Germany is this advocate of smaller member states. And, of course, when we see now maybe a, a weaker uh, a German government appearing that might have some consequences in the, in, the, in the ability of Germany to lead on some of the important policy issues. The second uh, reason why it is important, Germany, for Nordic countries is that there is a lot of policy overlap. Um, definitely when we think about economic policy, so this fiscal um, conservatism is also quite shared a lot, the focus on single market competition, but also when it comes to foreign policy, so the topic of our discussion to Today, the transatlantic uh, focus is very strong. So even Finland is not a member of NATO. The, the transatlantic bilateral alliance is, is very important for Finnish foreign and security policy and also for Finnish defense industri industrial policy. And, and now that um, the UK already left the EU as one of the advocates of transatlanticism, of um, uh, fiscal prudence of uh, strong competition policy, it's even more important that Germany plays, plays, plays a, a big role. And there's an interesting change now also in Finnish policy going on that was noted in an in a editorial in Helsinki Sanomat last week, um, uh, which is interesting to, uh, to see. Finland... Um, grows more and more, or the Finnish policy scene grows more and more skeptic about integration lately. Mm -hmm. Not so much in the field of foreign and security policy. I think you see quite a lot of overlap when uh, Ulrike talked about qualified majority voting and, and the other initiatives that are on the table that are shared also in the German party programs. So, so foreign policy uh, and a strong EU foreign policy that's still on the ticket also for, for uh, many Finnish parties. But when it comes to economic and fiscal policy, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, there is now, there is now uh, uh, um, the, the Finnish policy and the German policy are, are drifting a little bit apart, so to say. Uh, you saw Germany going quite strongly ahead with the next generation EU budget together with France. That was, uh, that was certainly a sign to be willing to step up also financially on the EU side. And here, this financial package actually had some difficulties uh, passing the Finnish parliament, which would, of course, have been like a huge catastrophe if it wouldn't have been the case, if, if the small Finnish parliament in comparison to other uh, countries would have stopped the overall EU uh, rescue package. So you can see uh, this, uh, yeah, there is this drift. While Germany is willing maybe to take more European action on many of these economic issues, uh, Finland is getting more and more conservative, looks more and more inward, has a lot of um, debates uh, internally, a strong Eurosceptic party. So, so how this relationship will develop will be interesting to see. Um, what I noticed, and I'm really glad about this overview, Ulrike, that you gave about the uh, German foreign and defense policy and the party programs. Now, I don't need to read all the party programs <laughs> because I got the, I got the too long, uh, don't need to read it overview already from you. But what, when I skimmed through it, I, I, I found interesting that... Um, they all picked up this uh, theme of European sovereignty. Mm -hmm. They don't use uh, European strategic autonomy, which is also quite interesting, mm -hmm. but I think you know that is a more controversial term. But this idea of European sovereignty is very strong in all the party programs. And they all also interpret it from their own position and make their own... Uh, give their own ideas to it. So when you read the, the CDU, CDU and the Green program, they talk a lot about um, technological innovation, technological sovereignty, investment in, in new technologies, and uh, that, that Europe shouldn't uh, lose track on those, while the Social Democrats focus much more on the solidarity element and that you, you need to uh, yeah, invest more in, 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 in common European policies and, and, and yeah, they... they, they drive up the solidarity element. So they interpret it from their own political standpoint, but they underline this European sovereignty. And I think this is something that, that policymakers here in Finland 
um, it's one thing they should keep in, in mind that this idea of European sovereignty and to, to make more steps towards a more capable Europe on economic policies, but also maybe on defense policies, is, is, uh, is now part of the political speak in, in Germany. And the second thing, uh, and I'm glad that uh, Ulrike pointed that out already, but I, what I found astonishing is this hardening stance towards China, uh, which is really not a typical position of Germany. Uh, we, we know that you know the German policy towards China used to be more focused on economic issues and uh, focused on the benefits of trade and didn't see the security implications of a rising China so much. But this now... The tune is completely different in the party programs that we we see, and and I wonder whether this, how you see that, whether this really indicates that we will see changes towards mm -hmm. a stronger focus on this uh, systemic rivalry, rivalry like they call it. Um, there are other parts like climate change where they still focus on on cooperation. You need to cooperate closely with with China uh, on, on climate change issue, but this systemic rivalry is quite strong. And I don't think, like, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether, um, you know, all of the Nordic countries, which rely so much also on international trade and trade with China, see how quickly actually the policy landscape in Germany is shifting towards a more skeptical outlook. And that should be maybe, uh, yeah, taken into consideration. I think that's a very interesting development you see in these elections. And that's part mm. for now. <laughs> Whoa, thank you. <laughs> We've talked I, you to death. I, mean, <laughs> uh, I think there's there's really there's a lot to chew on here. Um, I think we'll try to go uh, go delve deeper into these topics one by one. Perhaps I would like to start with uh, with uh, some kind of a look back and also uh, a few more general questions. Uh, Starting off by uh, um, what Jana said uh, in her last remarks, perhaps um, I'm, I'm probably exaggerating here, but um, uh, when it comes to Germany's present international role, there seem to be at least two strong schools of thought when, when it comes to explaining how Germany uh, um, or how German foreign security policy unfolds. First of all, there are those who argue that uh, Germany has gradually become uh, more aware of the power it has. It has also probably become more powerful, uh, in, at least in, in certain aspects. And it has also become more aware of what its partners expect of it. And uh, this school of thought would, uh, would sort of highlight that German foreign policy is now very much driven by Germany's gradual and rather hesitant attempts to assume more responsibility and to adapt to this kind of a more active role. And then there is um, a second very different kind of uh, school of thought, and that would be those people uh, who think that German foreign policy has actually long been, and it still continues to be, uh, mainly focused on its own economic interests. Mm -hmm. And and this, for example, has led it to, uh, to become involved in a project like Nord Stream 2, or it has resulted in, in this kind of a very pragmatic, uh, market-driven relationship uh, with China. Now, if you think about M Merkel's long period in office, do you think any of these two schools of thought uh, provide an adequate assessment of of uh, how German foreign uh, security policy has evolved and, and what do you expect to happen after Merkel? And then uh, another question that I, I would like to add here is uh, you, Jana, already said that uh, probably uh, most EU member states are, are going to miss Merkel very much. So uh, what kind of an impact will it have when, when uh, German foreign policy is no longer conducted by Merkel, when her personal experience, her uh, status, her authority, her skills are no longer available, uh, will her withdrawal in itself already have a big impact on, on German foreign security policy? And 
uh, and then perhaps uh, this is mostly to Ulrike. I, I know these are big questions here. Uh, but um, foreign policy has so far not, not been talked about very much in the electoral campaigns, which is not, not surprising. It tends not to be mm, talked uh, much. But um, do you expect foreign security policy uh, issues to be among the more controversial issues mm. when we uh, go into actual coalition negotiations? I, I would leave you with <laughs> yeah. these enormous okay. questions. So uh, maybe I, I just start with kind of your Germany more aware of its own power and is gradually and hesitantly adapting, although still skeptical, versus the is mostly interested in its own economic interests and just following through. And I think um, looking at recent events, m both. Uh, <laughs> are uh, to a certain extent true. I think uh, you can fairly say that um, Merkel's China policy and Russia policy had this element of not only Merkelism, but Merkentism, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, and that the economic interest of Germany um, was very important. Um, and that Germany also was accused often of yeah, not Europeanizing uh, its, for example, China policy enough. It's, just one example, when Germany, in, uh, during the German Council presidency, insisted on pushing or trying to push through uh, the investment agreement with China at the very last minute before the Biden administration came in, before like really consulting with them, which led to several accusations on Twitter <laughs> by the incoming Biden administration. So I think there is something to it, but just um, I think the overwhelming perception is just how more powerful Germany has become. And also, I think, actually, when you look at that survey, not the public survey that we are going to publish next week, stay tuned, but the one we published last year in 2020, and when we asked policymakers uh, in the 27 member states what they think of each other, and when you look at the data for Germany here, we see that Germany is seen by other Europeans as the most influential country clearly most influential, but also as the most attractive partner. Um, so the, the country that most other Europeans want to work with. Um, it is seen as well connected uh, in the EU to the east, north, um, west and south, and not like France has a, a significant deficit when it comes to ties to Central and Eastern Europe, and Germany is well connected. And Germany is also seen as most responsive. That means that actually, I think German diplomats can be pretty happy looking at uh, Germany's perception, or how Germany is perceived um, in Europe. Um, but I would, I would tend to, to agree with this. Germans became more aware, but are still very hesitant when it comes to using that leadership role. And just um, for, for next week, one of our key findings is also that the Germans don't basically trust themselves to, to lead the European Union in the European interest. They trust uh, themselves less than um, other Europeans trust Germany. This is, I think, also very interesting. Um, just on the impact of Merkel's exit, I think it will be really uh, enormous um, because Germany has been an integrating force um, and she has, looking, has been looking for solutions that included all 27, even if that took uh, long negotiations and many compromises. And even if you would argue that we had also maybe compromise too far when you look at the rule of law discussion and um, the EU budget and the recovery fund. So, but it was always the focus um, on the EU 27. Um, and so I think the problem is that there is no immediate heir. Um, so Emmanuel Macron will certainly try to lead the European Union, but he has, I think, not enough followers. Um, I think uh, Mr. Draghi in Italy will try to play a more uh, significant role as uh, does um, uh, the Spanish prime minister. But I think it's not, it's, it's, it's all of them are less influential than Merkel uh, was. And I think we see kind of a leadership void now um, immediately emerging. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not really clear how this gap will be filled. And if this focus on the kind of small uh, member states will, will continue. And um, so I, I mean, the good news here is that every candidate is a committed pro-European. Laschet, Scholz and Baerbock 
uh, they all emphasize that the EU is super important to them. And that is maybe the good news. And for foreign policy, I, I leave that to Ulrike. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe just one follow up. I mean, I don't think, I think that Merkel leaving is only going to be a short term problem in terms of personality. Because in the end, you know, the next chancellor, you know, there are some candidates are like better than others, but in the end, all of them are, will be German chancellor and they will have an impact and they will play this role. Like, I don't think there are any like complete outliers. So, and, and Merkel, when she came into power, people were skeptical as well. So I think they're going to grow into this. So I think on kind of personality, um, leadership void, that, that's going to be temporary. Yes, Macron would love to fill this role, but not only does he not have as many followers, he also has elections coming up, you know, relatively soon, and that's going to be a problem. For, for him too. But I think Jana's point about this all EU27 approach that Germany has had so far and that Merkel personally has had is really um, important because here I actually wonder whether we're going to see a, a bit of a change eventually and whether Germany is going to become a little bit more French in that regard. That the French are way more, you know, coalitions of the willing and avant-garde and whoever wants to work with us, we work with them and all the others, you know, your fault, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do it on our own. And I think even though, you know, all the, the parties and all the, the chancellor candidates still would like this EU27, again, pro, pro committed pro-Europeans, there is a bit of a sense that it hasn't really been working with all EU27. And we've had interesting discussions, especially between Baerbock from the Greens and Laschet from the CDU on core Europe coalitions. And, and, and Laschet hinted at saying that, yeah, maybe we can do some core Europe core Europe uh, coalitions, but it, it doesn't have to be the old core Europe, it can be other, but it kind of shows that maybe not always old EU27 because EU27 tends to move slowly. So that may be bad news for the Finns, I'm not quite sure, but I think it's it's an element of like, we want to move forward and if it doesn't work for 27, let's look at, at coalitions. I think the Finns have been pretty flexible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But I think, you know, smaller member states in general appreciated the fact that, you know, they were clearly being heard. But if it slows down everything, that's that's tricky, too. Um, but yeah, on, on foreign policy um, not being a big topic and defense policy not being a big topic. And this is, you know, one of my longstanding grievances in German <laughs> politics in, in general. That being said, I mean, we did have it's interesting. I think the very first Triel, so the very first um a TV a discussion between the three candidates was actually the one organized by, I think, the Munich Security Conference on foreign yeah. and defense policy. Uh, so, you know, there were these discussions. And of course, the Afghanistan situation withdrawal um, debacle has put foreign policy or defense policy on the forefront, at least for a moment. It's not, you know, the most, so the best discussion, you know, as in many countries, we focus on kind of emotional elements and kind of short term things, but at least, you know, it's, it's kind of in there. But your question basically is, could foreign policy, could defense policy be one of those things that actually make coalition building really tricky? Because what always happens, so we have the election, then we start thinking about coalitions, and these coalitions will have to write a coalition agreement. And these actually really matter. They are very specific. They say, we want to do this, this, and this. And, and you know, throughout the term, the, the parties say, but in the coalition agreement, we said this, so this, this really matters. And this takes a long time. And this is, by the way, how the last coalition discussions um, of the Jamaica coalition didn't, didn't turn out to work because they couldn't agree on this. So will foreign policy and defense policy be a big topic in there? I think the conceptual issues that I pointed out, like, you know, green feminist foreign policy and, and CDU saying, you know, military power matters and all of this. I don't think that this will matter because no one forces you to put this in the, in the coalition agreement, right? You don't have to put your kind of worldview in the coalition agreement. What you need to put in there is like, we're going to do X and we're not going to do going to do Y. And I would say there are two things that may be important enough in foreign and defense policy that they may actually be like real topics for, yeah, potential um, um, uh, division in, in, in the coalition agreement. And the first, again, depending on who works with whom, maybe um, the question of stronger and stronger European export controls for arms exports. This is a topic that the, the Greens have pushed. I think the, the SPD is in favor of this. The CDU basically says our export controls are strong enough. We don't need stronger ones. And if, for example, the Greens and the, 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 the CDU comes in coalition, um, that may be a foreign policy topic that may actually, be, may actually play a role. 
And the other big one is the one I mentioned on nuclear sharing, because even though, as I said in the part in the election programs, a number of parties just left this open in the coalition agreement. I mean, at one point they will need to take a decision. This is really one of those things where time is running out. So, so yeah, if, if it's a left wing coalition, they may actually put in there that they, they end nuclear sharing. I don't actually know. Like this is where my glass bowl, bowl fails. Um, and if it's a CDU led coalition, that's going to be an interesting uh, discussion. So this is the one. I think this is this is the one to watch. Not you know armed drones, as I'm always being asked about. There's no <laughs> way that the next coalition is going to fail over whether or not to buy armed drones. They're just not going to decide it. But nuclear sharing, maybe. And nuclear sharing is probably something that we are also interested as like defense geeks. I probably I wonder how much it resonates with with the with the um with the wider public. You know, if they follow these debates on defense. Uh, wider so much. public in Germany is. Uh, against the agreement. Wider public yeah. in Germany would be uh, supportive for exiting the nuclear yeah. sharing agreement. Mm -hmm. And then there's a big question on how you're going to exit mm -hmm. it, right? Exactly. Like, do you do it unilaterally because you don't have the right planes to carry nuclear mm -hmm. weapons or do you find a new agreement? And I think already the last uh, coalition agreement had this idea that yeah. there should be a discussion about in the in the multilateral context, in the yeah. NATO context about how to reform it. So that's probably always a way in the negotiations of the next coalition to maybe find an agreement, a formulation that kind of says we want to end nuclear sharing, but only with our partners. But it that would be the good news, right? Yeah. I mean, I, the, thing, the thing is, I think you basically have three possible options here. Either you, you just continue it. It's a possibility. You know, just say, whatever, it's going to be too much, ha too much hassle. We buy these planes and, and be done with it. That's almost the easiest solution. Mm. The hardest solution, I guess, will be the let's renegotiate. Because as experts know, nuclear sharing as it works at the moment doesn't really make a lot of sense, militarily speaking. Like we have these weapons we all agree are probably never going to use because again, militarily it doesn't make sense. So there is a real question of should we really be buying planes that cost millions and billions to be able to deliver weapons that we can't imagine a scenario we're ever going to need to do so. so, so But, but renegotiating is going to be really difficult because this is a, this is then a NATO topic. It's a topic with the transatlantic relationship, the U.S. relationship. But that's actually Central and Eastern Europe. Also. Oh, Central and Eastern <laughs> Europe, certainly. Yeah. So, so this is going to be a real big deal. But this is kind of what probably should be done. Mm -hmm. But then is option three, and that's the one I actually worry about, which is you just kind of stumble out of nuclear sharing because mm -hmm. you can't quite decide to buy a new airplane and at one point your own airplanes don't fly anymore and someone one day <laughs> wakes up and says, well, we're not actually a member of nuclear sharing anymore because, because we can't deliver those, mm -hmm. those weapons. And I would assume that the US wouldn't be happy about this. I would assume that maybe the Eastern Europeans would then be like, well, if you don't want to be part of this, maybe we can. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know, but this is the kind of option that where the kind of muddling through leads to the worst possible situation, in my view. And yeah, the discussion is also in... Oh, sorry, Thomas, you're, you're sharing, but we're kind of taken away. So yeah. yeah, no, yeah. if but you still have something to add. But maybe one because the, I think foreign policy matters in one um, concrete um, aspect uh, when it comes to the possibility to form a coalition with a radical left, mm. because it, it, it fails only, uh, uh, it would fail only because, because of, foreign of foreign and policy. security policy. Yeah. So uh, domestic policy, they would find a perfect agreement, but the CD, uh, the, the SPD and the Greens would have problems to form a coalition with a party that says, let's basically exit NATO and end all military missions, even those within the NATO format, kind of they don't d distinguish between military interventions and yeah. kind of... <laughs> Can I ask a yeah. question here? Do you see that as a, as a, as a possibility, actually, that there might be this red, red Green coalition, or do you think it's now brought into the discourse uh, to kind of have <clears> this <throat> red scare campaign, this Rote Socken campaign by the by the CDU? Is there, especially on the side of the Greens, I guess, which tends to look more towards the middle now and, and wants to portray a responsible foreign policy? They might be hesitant, especially the leadership of the Greens, to, to form such a coalition. So this is, of course, source for a lot of speculation right now. I would personally say. It's not very likely. I don't see it. I see it as a bargaining chip for the SPD vis-a-vis -vis negotiations with the FDP uh, in particular right. to show them, look, we have another um, 
opportunity. And if you kind of walk out of the negotiations again, like you did with the Jamaica coalition, we just go kind of with the left party. Right. I cannot imagine a scenario that this green leadership would join a coalition also when it comes to relationship with Russia, view on China, the NATO uh, transatlantic alliance thing, and the European thing. Uh, they are not very fond yeah. of the EU as it is, uh, mm. the left party. <laughs> but there are a lot of people who are really worried about this. And it's, it's in the numbers, it's a possibility. Mm. And in theory, the left shouldn't be able to join such a coalition exactly because of foreign and security policy and not just because you don't they don't like NATO but they literally have a line and this is relatively rare they literally the link has literally a line in their in their party uh, election program that says we will not join a government that supports and carries out combat operations abroad and they literally mean you know um, station and troops, you know, on, on NATO's eastern flank, Afghanistan, of course, but even training missions, like it, 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 it really is, is quite extensive. Um, a government that supports militarization, which in the view of the, the left party is basically just more money for defense in general. So they, they ha literally have a line of, we will not join such a, such a government. So Until honestly, they join. If, they, if they join, <laughs> I will be the first one to just kind of keep mentioning <laughs> You know, they said uh, otherwise. So now, now we are here circling around uh, the transatlantic <laughs> relationship. So let me just throw in a couple of questions uh, with regard to that topic, which I know is quite uh, close to your hearts as well, something you have, have been following rather closely. So Trump's period in office was a rather turbulent period for all EU member states, but uh, it was particularly dramatic for Germany, perhaps because Germany seemed to be uh, Trump's favorite European scapegoat. Uh, do, you, do you think uh, that Trump's period in office has caused fundamental or permanent damage to US-German relations? Or is that now all in the past with, uh, with the Biden administration? And then um, if we think about the future of the transatlantic relationship, uh, China has already been mentioned here several times. Will the future of US-German relations actually depend very much on how Germany positions itself vis-a-vis -vis China? Mm -hmm. How important will that be for the future of, of the transatlantic relationship? And then uh, thirdly here, perhaps uh, Afghanistan, I know, has, has been now in the uh, headlines in Germany as well. And, and it was also part of the first official TV debate, or official, and this first clear that, that we had uh, some time ago. Uh, what about the US withdrawal from Afghanistan? Will the fallout of the operation have an impact on how Germany thinks about uh, the US in general, or more specifically about the, the Biden administration? Who would like to start? I can go briefly on yeah, um, really brief points on all of these points. So I think uh, the Trump time has, yes, has created some permanent damage in trust of the Germans towards the US. But if I may allow myself that comment, I think that may actually be a good thing insofar as it may have created a slightly more realistic view of the US and Germany. Because I think that there was two, that, that at least German the kind of political realm, I want to say almost bought up too much this, you know, the US as this uh, benign power in the world, policemen providing security to Europeans, etc., etc. And, 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 you know, this couldn't go on forever and it isn't exactly realistic. And so maybe, you know, the shock of Trump has brought home the point to, to Germans that, well, actually, yes, the, the US is the most important partner. It's clearly the most important security partner. All of this is still true. And, it's, and, and, and they are still a reliable ally in NATO and all of this. I'm absolutely not questioning this. But, but that, you know, this element of maybe we need to take care of ourselves a little bit more, I think, I, I think that that remains um, and has actually been um, shown again with the Afghanistan um, uh, um, actions by Biden, and, and that may eventually actually be a, a, a good thing. 
on the positioning towards China and whether that influences the, the German-U.S. relationship. And actually, I think it's the same question for all of Europe, right? Will, will Europe's yeah. positioning towards yeah. China influence, change, or determine the transatlantic relationship? It's interesting because on the one hand, I would say, yes, this is the elephant in the room. This is like the one important topic that the U.S. really wants Germany and, and Europe to position itself um, um, on. But there is a question of like, what's the alternative if you know Germany and Europe basically continues this kind of middle road and doesn't really want to side with the US and and just does you know bits and pieces here and there, do we think that the US is gonna I don't know stop the the, the transatlantic relationship? I mean Europe is still such an important partner that I, I I think there's a bit of a danger that we overplay this because I can't quite see you know the transatlantic relationship really breaking over the China issue either. But you know I could definitely be wrong on that. And then very briefly on the fallout um, regarding Afghanistan or from Afghanistan. I want to say no, it doesn't have the, the biggest impact. I mean, right now, all of a sudden we discuss, you know, German defense capabilities, European defense capabilities. There is this, from my point of view, slightly weird narrative that, that Afghanistan was this test case for European strategic sovereignty or European um, capabilities. But overall, I mean, the Europeans wanted to withdraw as well. Um, sure, the withdrawal wasn't done greatly and there wasn't enough coordination between, between the allies. But I, I think eventually this will be forgotten and, and, and won't, be, won't play this enormous role. But maybe Anna disagrees. So on the transatlantic trust in Germany. So after the election of Joe Biden, I think in every single... Um, conversation I had, people brought up the 2024 scenario. Mm. So I think there is every willingness to work as closely as possible with the Biden administration. And there was, of course, a big sigh of relief uh, in Berlin. But then and shock, had sent shockwaves through Germany. Also, when like the America watchers look a bit closer um, at the future of the Republican Party, so the scenario to have another Republican president um, and then kind of the, the transformation of the Republican Party um, to become basically Trump's party, all this has created not skepticism so much vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration, but more the political system and actually coming back to our polling again, not the one, an old one um, we did last year in November, um, we saw that even after the election of Joe Biden, and we saw this again in April, European publics were, um, and also the Germans, but not, not as an outlier, were um, actually skeptical. There was relief and appreciation of the comeback of the United States as a leader, but still skepticism. And I think Germany is no exception here. However, if you go very much uh, into the nuances, for example, in the defense ministry, people are much more positive about the transatlantic relationship still. And they have been during the Trump administration because the relationship um, of the German defense ministry and the Pentagon have been really uh, good also during the Trump years. So if you talk to actually um, defense officials, and not only because they always say we cannot imagine defending Europe without the United States, but really because of good working relations, there is more trust. And when you, th then in other ministries, it has also to do with uh, party affiliation. So uh, I think the CDU would, I would consider still the most kind of, the party with the biggest transatlantic commitment. Um, other parties like the Greens or also the SPD being more open of, free when it comes to talking about strategic autonomy already early on. I mean, now it's gone mainstream, as you said, Niklas, I think this is exactly right. Um, on Afghanistan, I think the biggest impact for Germany would be that um, the military interventions of the future. I think the main takeaway from German officials and the public is we did Afghanistan forever. It's a failed mission. Uh, the uh, Americans have done uh, the Iraq war and uh, everything that came afterwards. Uh, this was a huge mess. Um, other Europeans, not us Germans, because we were wise enough to abstain, um, did Libya, a uh, huge catastrophe. So what I fear, actually, personally, not because I'm a big fan of military interventions, but because I think they will be remain necessary, is that we see increasing intervention fatigue in Germany, um, increasing skepticism, 
how the hell this could be a good idea if everything we tried recently was just a failure. And also the, the, what I wish would be a reflection on this approach of training and equipping partners um, in because that's what we actually do in Mali. And I think the next big debate we will have in Germany is about the Sahel, our engagement there, our strategy there. And maybe that's also, I think, very interesting mm. uh, for Finland. And briefly on China. So I think Merkel and Macron have been very pleased to see the outcome of the uh, NATO communique in June and to not make China too much of a topic. So I think they still try to walk when it comes to foreign uh, or security and defense policy, this thin line of um, not portraying China too much as only basically an adversary. Uh, and so we Germans don't see China as a military threat. And I mean, there are also other voices in Germany, but but that was something that um, I think was interesting to see that the Germans were willing to agree to a certain wording, but that everybody was pleased that it was not too much about China and that yeah the balance, the China threat and the Russia threat uh, in the NATO community was, or that NATO got it right from a German perspective. Yeah, this this NATO community is actually an interesting point because you probably also saw the Biden administration making a step towards Europe in terms of how they formulated it and, and taking into account uh, some of the European reservations towards uh, greater competition with China. So I would agree uh, with both of you that this might not be like, um, there might not be a transatlantic fallout from the uh, great power competition uh, just because um, there are different policy opinions and, and that might they might have different positions. But but I do worry whether um, Europe is sleepwalking into like into this great power competition without taking the right consequences from it. Because yes, the, 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 the problem might not be that, that there are policy differences, but the problem might be that just the US steps up the great power competition game so much that the EU or Europe is, is suddenly in the position where they have to choose. How, how is it going to be about, and, and you work much more with technology, so I, I pro probably have to give it to Enrique at this point, but how is it going to be about a 6G technology, for example? Will there be suddenly two standards, one in China and one in the US? And what does it mean for companies like Ericsson or Nokia? They cannot, um, they don't have the means maybe to produce from both markets. So the risk for Europe is rather that, you know, they, they, they are not prepared for for a, a world that is decoupling, uh, I think. And um, yeah, I would maybe also disagree a little bit what with um, how, you, how you framed the impact of Afghanistan and that you said there won't be much impact. I, I totally agree. There was a lot of overreaction in the immediate aftermath. There was this FT editorial where they said, oh, now the Baltics have to be worried about NATO 5 article. Uh, um, um, guarantees and, and will the U.S. fight for us? I think, you know, that is very much still in the U.S. interest, uh, European security. Um, so I don't think there's a fundamental, as, at least not in a German pers perspective, there's not a fundamental re-evaluation of, of, of the transatlantic alliance. But there might be also the sense that things cannot go on, and that was also already during the Trump years, think, things cannot go on as they were. And there's a lot of talk, of course, about... Um, military burden sharing, increasing capabilities and having having stronger European um, um, pillar in NATO when it comes to capabilities. But uh, what also Afghanistan showed is that there should be more maybe strategic burden sharing as well. And that it's not just about the capabilities and how much money you pour into a country, but that you also have the right strategies so that that the, if, if Europe is supposed to take a bigger role in transatlantic alliance capability wise, they should also get their strategies right and, mm -hmm. and and talk much more when it comes to uh, NATO missions uh, about how, what are the goals, what are the means to implement them. And uh, I think there in the past, the, the trust towards the Pentagon and their, um, their, their abilities was maybe a bit too high. And uh, that, that might, might be a positive consequence also if Europe would step up its game there. And you're let, right, let, the let, Germans were disappointed that they did not get consulted. Mm. They basically... I mean, the Biden administration came in with this big promise, we talk to you Europeans before we decide things. And Afghanistan is a clear case that this 
is not the new normal that there are exceptions. <laughs> okay, let me uh, just stop you here. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have, have, we, have we, we have, we have ten minutes left, <laughs> and there are still two topics that I would like us to cover. I wouldn't like to group them together, but I, I, I think I'm forced to. Uh, that's Russia, and and the EU, and. Um, very perhaps uh, we'll we'll just unlikely. <laughs> perhaps we'll just do uh, some kind of a pick and choose. So I'll I'll put forward a couple of questions that I would like you to address, and and you'll just uh, choose uh, which you like to comment on. First of all, on Russia, which is of course a big topic in in Finland. It sometimes seems that Germany is a bit of a Janus-faced actor mm -hmm. when it comes to its relationship with Russia. So on the one hand, uh, there's this whole post-politic tradition that is still uh, alive in some quarters. Uh, there is Germany's earlier idea of a modernization partnership. There is Nord Stream 2. There was this push uh, by uh, Merkel and Macron for a summit with Putin. And on the other hand, already when Merkel started her term, she was considered to have brought in a new, more critical tone vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Germany was also very influential in shaping the EU's response to the Ukraine crisis, including the sanctions policy. And Germany was the country where Alexei Navalny was treated and where his poisoning was also confirmed, uh, which led to rather harsh reactions from, uh, from uh, German politicians. So somewhere behind this is is there a coherent or a consistent <laughs> policy line when it comes to Russia? That would be something uh, that I would love to hear. And then uh, when it comes to the EU, strategic autonomy is, of course, a big topic. Uh, Niklas knows all about it. Um, again, this is an area where we have had somewhat mixed messages from Germany. So Merkel talked about how Europeans need to take their fate into their own hands. Uh, but then again, uh, Anne Kramp Karrenbauer uh, uh, said that the idea of str strategic autonomy goes too far if it nurtures the illusion that, uh, that the security, stability, and prosperity in Europe could be guaranteed without uh, the US and without NATO. Of course, no one suggested that, but uh, but still, I, I think it, it's about the way uh, she formulated this that uh, did express some. Uh, skepticism so so how does germany stand on that and then finally when it comes to uh, eu defense you already mentioned that the european army is is this kind of a standard thing that uh, that the mainstream german parties put in their programs they have been there uh, for a long time already uh, what does germany actually want from uh, from eu when it comes to security and defense and uh, like i said we only have uh, 8 minutes now so uh, please pick and choose and, and be brief. Should I maybe start and we do the please. opposite direction? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, so um, hmm, probably you, you expect me to talk about European strategic autonomy. No, you can. You can <laughs> okay, you can I can choose. Okay, sorry. So um, on, on Russia, I think you're right that there's a lot of incoherence in, 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 in some of the German policy positions and you outlined that quite well. I think part of the reason why you see different approaches of Germany uh, is that they try to be this balancing factor in EU politics and that this is their way also to, um, to, to, to play a leadership role within the EU. So they try to avoid to go all the way the Baltic or Central European line um, where they are strongly calling out uh, uh, Russian actions and, and go go stronger into sanctions and and and, and call off Nord Stream two, and 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 go to into that direction. On the other hand, uh, they also don't go the way f France uh, appears to go in some way, which with things like okay, you know, this Eastern European issue. It's not actually an issue because we have the nuclear umbrella and Russia won't do thing do anything bad. So we can, uh, we should rather focus on other uh, problems and 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 enforce dialogue. So so uh, and and seek dialogue with Rus Russia. So I think they are trying to 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 follow this 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 balanced line in in in, in European policies and have been quite 
efficient in, in doing that, I would say. Uh, I, I don't think it would be wise for Germany. Well, they would not listen to me now, the next government. But now to do a, to do a strong turn in either or the direction, uh, either the hawkish direction or the dovish direction, but but um, but but moderate these different issues and uh, and 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 focus on dialogue where 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 it is possible, but but which is anyways going on. But but when it's necessary to to enforce international law and uh, and and show also European interests. Reverse order, so that means all right. <laughs> um, I'll take you to speak autonomy briefly. So, um, basically, the the line that most Germans, party uh, officials, etc., um, use is European strategic sovereignty or European sovereignty simply because autonomy in the ear of many Germans sounded a bit too much like it was about being autonomous from the US, mm. which they don't want. There is this line, this is a CDU line, but I think it's shared quite widely about remaining transatlantic but becoming more European. Um, and I think that's the that's the overall goal. So, so yes, on the one hand, um, Pretty much everyone wants Europe to be a strengthened actor, but it shouldn't be to the detriment of the transatlantic relationship. And I think this is why the autonomy bit was a bit um, uh, uh, critical. Actually, I think what fits in here quite nicely is just a footnote on, on the tech stuff, because on tech, I mean, Europe, Europe doesn't want technology to be one of those areas where they need to decide between the US and China. They would actually want to have a kind of third way of saying, you know, we do it, we do it um, on our own. So tech would be an area of European strategic sovereignty. The problem is just that, you know, that's not exactly what the trans what, what the US would, would like, right? They kind of want Europe to side with the US and, and be done with it. So 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 here the sovereignty um, efforts could create some, you know, tensions. That's not overemphasized, but that, that tension. And on the European army, I mean, our colleague Nick Whitney had this great article um, where, where he said that European politicians, and I think this is particularly true for German politicians, seem to have this Tourette syndrome where every once in a while they just need to say European army um, in, in, in a discussion about European um, defense. I mean, what, what does Germany actually want uh, from Europe or, or for Europe when it comes to defense? A very cynical reading of all this talk about European army and, and European cooperation would be that a lot of German politicians just want to put the defense stuff on the European level so that you don't need to do it on the national level because you know, we don't really like to do this and Europe and the EU is nice and great and we all agree that they're the good guys so can't we do the military stuff there as well. That's a kind of cynical reading and I think that this happens but maybe the, the more pragmatic reading is that it does of course make sense from a kind of efficiency point of view to do more together at the European level. I mean there's always this line that together we have like a million soldiers but but couldn't do like an Afghanistan uh, um, uh, withdrawal properly like that obviously is, is a bit uh, problematic so it would make sense to work together and it would be part of being a stronger actor. So I think this is maybe the the, the Macron line and I think some some people, um, uh, yeah, support support that approach as well. So we are running out of time. Just two footnotes um, on Russia. I think when you look at Armin Laschet and, and Olaf Scholz, um, this Janus faced um, approach will continue. When Armin Laschet was asked uh, in a public debate um, in the Q&A uh, what he would change vis-a-vis uh, -vis Merkel's Russia policy, he literally said nothing. <laughs> Um, and all the things that you have mentioned, Ostpolitik, Modernization Partnership and Nord Stream um, 2 were projects that were invented by the SPD. So I, I don't I, I see this strong heritage uh, still prevailing. At the other hand, the Greens are strong opponents of Nord Stream 2, much more critical. So you would see two forces um, and the, the FDP also uh, slightly more hawkish on, on, on Russia. So um, but that all speaks for what Niklas has uh explained, I think, brilliantly. And on the uh, EU defense, not European army, I think this is out of the question, but EU defense question, I think with an SPD and Green government, with the FDP, we would see a stronger emphasis, at least rhetorically, and also kind of, I think, where the, yeah, where the political attention goes to on EU defense, because as Rico said, it takes the edges away from this pretty ugly kind of military topic um, so and and the CDU 
like under uh, AKK strong stronger emphasis on NATO. So I think it's nuances. It's not completely uh, different, but I think with an SPD-led government, more emphasis on EU defense um, than we would see under a, a CDU-led government. But this is speculation and comes back to the glass ball reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we're now running out of time. I think we would have all been able to continue this discussion for quite a while. And I, I think we will in other formats. There's interesting stuff coming from the ECFR. Yeah, the 14th of <laughs> September, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, Niklas and I have an article in Ulko, Ulko Politica magazine about Merkel's legacy in uh, foreign security policy and EU matters. And uh, I'm sure we will all keep commenting on the German elections in, in one way or another. Uh, this has been a pleasure for me. And uh, for us. Thank you for hosting. Uh, I would like, uh, like to uh, announce this seminar now closed. Thank you very much. Thank you.